Ruiz. Hello and welcome to another edition of Truth and Rhythm, brought to you by Funkinslift.net. This is the interview show that gets deep in the pocket with contemporary music's foremost masters of the groove. I'm your host, Scott Dr. Jake Skolfein, musicologist and author of Everything is on the One, The First Guide to Funk. If you don't have your copy, get on over to Amazon and pick one up. You'll be so glad you did. Whether you're watching the video version of this at Funkinstuff.net or on YouTube or listening to the audio-only podcast version from providers like iTunes and Spotify. As always, I thank you so much for your continued interest and support in the show. Speaking of which, if you haven't already done so, subscribe to the Funk and Stuff channel on YouTube. That's where Truth and Rhythm lives. All kinds of goodies you'll get, uh, early premieres, and it's all free, so make sure you sign up. Tell a friend, tell family. Also get your official Truth and Rhythm and Funk and Stuff gear at the FunkinStuff.net store. Cool stuff like I'm wearing right here, Truth and Rhythm shirts, show your support and love of the show and also the musicians and the music that they represent. Um, also want to give a shout out to the Funk Exhibition Center and Hall of Fame in Dayton, Ohio, of which I'm very proud to be an official Funk Ambassador. Go to thefunkcenter.org to learn more and keep the funk alive. And now, with all that, it's time to get on with the show. Enjoy. I'm pleased to welcome to the Truth and Rhythm Mothership, guitarist Trey Stone, a rhythm and blues music hall of famer who has recorded and performed with a very impressive list of funk and soul headliners. Those include Starguard, Rose Royce, Undisputed Truth, General Kane, Tower of Power, Bootsy Collins, George Clinton, and Keith Washington. Trey, how are you? Thank you for coming to the show today. I'm doing fine. Before we get started here, let me, my chat is going crazy without <laughs> All right. Okay. I'm doing great, man. How about yourself? I'm doing pretty well. Thank you. Uh, what's your cat's name? Oh, that that's uh, Milo, uh, Milo. Milo. Milo? Yeah. Like in the movie, Otis and Milo? Yeah. O yeah. Milo and Otis? We, we had a cat named, my, uh, my wife had a cat named uh, Milo, and the other one was named Otis. And, um, yeah, so <laughs> we have three cats now, but none are in here, so we'll be good. <laughs> yeah. Uh, where, where are you coming to us from today? I'm in South Lake Tahoe, California. Uh, beautiful area. I love it. That's uh, where we, uh, my wife and I honeymooned. Oh, really? Yeah. Cool. Right there on the lakefront. Yeah. I, I enjoy it quite a bit. I've been here 26 years, man. Wow. You know how to live uh, with that. I mean, that's one of the most beautiful spots there is, as far as I'm concerned. Yeah. It's, it's, uh, I came up actually, uh, it was in the 90s I came up. Uh, my father was living in uh, Reno, Nevada. I had a friend that was doing uh, some uh, musical theater, and I just got off tour with uh, uh, Bootsy and uh, Delight, and I decided to stay here. I liked it a lot. <laughs> Wise choice. I mean, I grew up in Southern California, so I've been there many times, and uh, I miss it. Um, yeah, so nothing like that uh, green blue water of Lake Tahoe. Oh, yeah. Totally cool. <laughs> and the water's cold. <laughs> cold and deep and yeah. Man. And uh, you know, you got everything there because you got the gambling and you got the lake and you got skiing. Yeah. Yeah. I ski it's so it's fun. Yeah. yeah. Very cool. Well thank you for joining the show. Much appreciated. I've been a fan for a long time and uh it's great to have you on and, and talk about your fantastic career. 
Right on. So with that, um, let's uh, revert a little bit back and find out uh, how Trey Stone uh, first gravitated toward the guitar and um, and what was your first, uh, you know, experience performing in front of people. All right. Well, I, before I started playing guitar, I was a trombone player in high school, in junior high school. <laughs> You know, and uh, my mother took me to one of my first concerts, uh, 1969, and it changed my life. My mother took me to this concert, you know. So, <laughs> it was a Jimi Hendrix concert in San Bernardino. Wow. Yeah. Enjoyed it a uh, lot and uh, decided I start playing guitar. So I played, I first started playing guitar, uh, just playing local bands in town, and I hooked up with a band called um, Bump City. Not to be confused with Tower of Bump City, but <laughs> this is a different Bump City. Um, it's kind of a local band. We uh, did a lot of touring and stuff, and uh, we, we uh, got offered um, a tour uh, that um, Rose Royce was on, and that's how we met Rose Royce. And uh, um, so it was what, 80, 82, something like that. <laughs> I'm not sure. Yeah. So, so your your first um, performances were with that uh, group you mentioned, Bump City. Yeah. Right? And you guys were doing uh, covers or some original stuff or what? We were doing, doing covers, but we, we did play a lot of dance circuits, you know. Um, we were really popular in, in Orange County, Los Angeles area, you know. Um, of course, we used to tour. Our, our tours consisted of an old school bus, <laughs> you know, to Canada, to Calgary, and uh, places like that up north, so. Did you, did you ever get to open for anyone that we would have heard of when you were with that group? Uh, yes, we, we opened up for like the Whispers. I don't know if you remember the Whispers. Uh, uh, you know, a few local bands at the time that, you know, that we played, uh, toured with. Not too many famous songs, you know, but when we finally got hooked up with uh, Norman Whitfield, and uh, Norman really liked my playing a lot. And I started playing um, with a group called Starguard, which was uh, Which Way Is Up, Richard Pryor. Man. That was the first track that I did, uh, Which Way Is Up. Yeah, that's a favorite for sure. Um, yeah. I remember the movie, uh, which was pretty yeah. good, but I like the song <laughs> even better. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so how did you meet uh, Norman Whitfield exactly? Uh, we were playing the band Bump City, uh, somehow or another. I forgot exactly how it went, but uh, we hooked up with Norman to do some demos. And uh, one of the demos was uh, Which Way Is Up. And then we did some other stuff. And I finally, um, that band got signed to uh, Motown. And then I was pretty much doing a lot of session work for Norman. A lot of different groups that were coming out for uh, Whitfield Records, like uh, Junior Walker and the All Stars, Stargard, you know, uh, The Undisputed Truth, of course. And I did uh, um, quite a, uh, for about maybe about six, seven albums for Whitfield Records, you know. Um, Rose Royce, Rose Royce Strikes Back, uh, Best of Rose Royce, you know, so. Yeah, I had um, um, Mark Cannoli. Were you part of the same group or? Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Mark, so Mark was yeah, on the show. Was, yeah, Bump City. He was with Bump City. Yeah. Oh, okay. And then we, you know, Mark Cannoli, uh, we were all in Bump City at one time. And then we got, you know, started working with Norman, you know. And we kind of branched out of, on a few of Norman's acts, you know, so. Yeah, it was like a assembly line, basically. I mean, the Motown influence with Norman Whitfield uh, transporting that to the, like, you know, West Coast, right? And, right. And uh, doing right. his, his little stable of acts. Right, exactly. Exactly. 
So were you just pretty much uh, toiling away in the studio like 24-7 for him, or what was it like? 24-7, quite a bit, man. We did, uh, like I said, um, we were part of his little home recording team. Like well, Everybody had their little camps. Like you had the um, Solar Records camp, you had, you know, uh, Jimmy Jam and their camp, and Norman Whitfield had his camp, you know. So we played on a lot of lot of releases coming out of, out of Whitfield Records. And, and what kind of camp counselor was he? <laughs> he was cool. Norman was cool to work for. My definite mentor. You know, um, very cool to work for. Put in a lot of hours at a studio he owned called uh, Fort Knox. There in Los Angeles. You know, so. And what would you say he was uh, stern or loose in the uh, studio? He, he was stern. He knew what he wanted. He knew exactly what he wanted. You know, um, I remember uh, doing Which Way Is Up. It was uh, me and another guitar player, Wawa Watson, Melvin mm -hmm. Reagan. Yeah, and um, we were we ended up being on a lot of records for Norman, and I was pretty much you know baby Wawa as they called it. <laughs> you know. So. Yeah, I, I regretted not being able to get him on this show. Uh, he left us, I guess, about a year ago or t year or two ago now. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, what a great player. Coming in the studio was just uh, definitely something that uh, to be to be seen. Uh, that was one of my things. I I was always the guy in, in Norman's studio was always watching what he was doing, you know, and how he was getting what he was getting from different different folks, uh, production wise. Um, I, I ended up playing a lot of stuff that Wawa uh, and I, you know, Wawa would do a lot of the rhythm parts, and I would play a lot of the solo parts, you know, so, um, which was really cool. I learned a lot from Wawa, yeah. Um, what would you say sort of uh, distinguished your particular style? You mentioned, you know, Jimi Hendrix inspired you to pick up a guitar. Did you have any formal lessons, and and you know how do you hone your craft? No, I didn't have any formal lessons except for um, you know my just what I was actually listening to at the time. I you know Hendrix was a definitely uh, played a big role in what, how what I wanted to play, but I also touched on different areas of you know like the blues, you know some jazz, at the time being self-taught, you know so. Did you also favor a Strat, or what was your main instrument? Yeah, uh, well, my first guitar that uh, I was using, actually, it was an old Sears Silvertone <laughs> guitar, which is probably worth a lot of money now. But uh, I, uh, um, I, I favored a 345 uh, Gibson, which was uh, kind of a BB King type of guitar, you know. Actually bought me a guitar. He wanted me to use this particular guitar for certain tracks, which was a Strat that I used to own. You know, uh, so I started playing a lot of Strats until I was doing the funk thing. You know, so I, I can only imagine how much you guys were locked into just incredible grooves, like endlessly in that studio. Oh yeah, oh yeah. <laughs> for a lot of different acts that we used to do that for, you know. So. What well, what were the uh, Rolls Royce people like? The Rolls Royce was a really, I mean, they were you know another band that came up. You know, uh, Norman, Norman found, found out for him and him and a friend of his, uh, Joe Harris. Um, Rolls Royce uh, played on a lot of tracks, and that's how we all got in the intermingled playing with you know with each other. Um, a lot of those records, uh, you know, like uh, Rolls Royce albums that I played on, like In Full Bloom, uh, Rolls Royce Connection, uh, the best of uh, Rolls Royce, Rolls Royce records from Strikes Back. <laughs> so, yeah. Well, In Full Bloom is probably my favorite of theirs. That's a great record. Yeah, it's a good record. Yeah. Um, what was that one, Try If It Makes You Feel Like Dancing? Did you play in that one? Oh, yeah. yeah. That is a groove, oh, man. Yeah. <laughs> that one is stomp that one is stomping big time. Yeah. Yeah. Um 
What about the uh, Star Guard ladies? Did you get to meet them? Oh uh, yeah, that was like I said. Uh, their first big record was "Which Way Is Up," you know, for the movie Richard Pryor, and uh, did some touring with the uh, Star Guard. Uh, we op opened up for Bootsy. Bootsy. Back then, I didn't know I was going to eventually meet up with Bootsy and be in one of Bootsy's bands. But yeah, we opened up for Bootsy. We did a. Uh, some Isley Brother tours and stuff with those Star Guard. So. Yeah, I don't know if it was their second album, maybe, that had that track Star Bob on it. Um, yeah. That, that track was so funky. I thought it was P Funk when I first heard it. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, that was some fun stuff, man. So, uh, a good fit with Bootsy, I think. Yeah, yeah. The, the, those tours were, man, <laughs> we did a lot of touring, too, you know. Um, Especially uh, doing some of the stuff that we did for the, the films because we ended up doing uh, Which Way Is Up, but we also did another one for Richard Pryor called Bustin' Loose in the movie Bustin' Loose with Richard Pryor, uh, produced by Mark Davis, who was producing a lot of work for Norman Whitfield as well. So, yeah, is that the one? Was that the one where he was a race car driver or? No, that was that was uh, Blue Street. Oh, okay. Now Not, this one, uh, Bustin' Loose was uh, one that he was, uh, what was he, he was something, <laughs> it's, it's, I can't remember exactly what it was, but it was something. Uh, like a sanitation worker maybe or something? Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's <laughs> <what it> <laughs> yeah, those yeah. were fun movies. Um, and the music helped make them that much more fun. Yeah, yeah, yeah. so. We kind of made a little mark with that stuff, you know. It was cool. Yeah, well, the the attitude of the music reflected the attitude of those movies. It was just all, you know. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> uh, man, so you were on the road with the Isleys and Bootsy, and um, that must have been pretty amazing. Yeah. A lot of touring. A lot of touring. I was, you know, kind of young coming out to box, you know, so... It was fun. I, I really enjoyed that. Was there any uh, particular show that just stands out to you, especially for some reason? Uh, for uh, when I was doing Boots, I mean, when I was doing Rose Royce, you saying? Uh, any any of the times you're out on the road in the late 70s, early 80s, is there a show in particular that for some reason just really has a memory for you? Uh, Stargard opening uh, for Bootsy Collins at the Capitol Center there in uh, D.C. You know, that was a really, really big show and just kind of just changed everything for me, you know, so. Would you say that was 78 or 79 or? 78, 79, yeah. So I saw uh, Bootsy's uh, Monster Rock Tour 78 at the L.A. Forum, but that was with uh, Enchantment and Radio. Yeah, I, 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 we did some shows with, I remember Radio, Ray Parker at Radio. We did some shows for that uh, with Bootsy as well. I don't, know, I don't think it was Enchantment, but uh, I know we were around that era. That era. Uh, I was. F I mean, Bootsy's band was so tight. I mean, they were incredible then. Oh yeah, a lot of fun, man. I always looked up to that. I said there was always uh, um, three bands that I always wanted to play in in my music career that you know, and I ended up playing with them. You know, Rose Royce. Uh, Star Guard, you know, Tower Power. I also wanted to be with Sly Stone, but I didn't kind of quite make it to, <laughs> to work with Sly, so. Yeah, he's, he's, he's still with us, but I don't know if it's going to work out. <laughs> Wish him well. Um, so, what, you played uh, live with Rose Royce as well, then? Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, I saw them on at least one or two of those funk fest kind of shows right yeah um they had some great players on keys yeah. and bass and yeah michael nash on keys uh, uh the guitar player at that time uh, um was quite an inspiration for me you know but norman norman wanted he wanted if we had to put all the guitar players that were on these tracks that he cut, he would do that to put them on a show, you know. So, 
A lot of that's, man. Did you ever get to see the uh, P Funk Mothership show during this? Oh episode? yeah, oh yeah. What, what was that experience like for you? Uh, crazy. <laughs> Times Square P Funk uh, Mothership landing. Yeah. Yeah. So. Was that also inspiring? Yes, it was. Really, it was really big. You know, the P Funk thing was just opening up to be a quite a quite a big thing for funk music. You know, uh, in general. Um, which eventually, you know, all this uh, the work that I was doing for for Norman, and for uh, you know, I eventually started playing with the Undisputed Truth. You know, uh, we did did a couple albums for the Truth. Um, did you tour with them at all too? Yeah, matter of fact, that uh, uh, well, Undisputed Truth with Joe Harris. Me and Joe became a, a real good friends and started writing a lot together. You know, um, some of those shows uh, ended up being quite, quite happened. <laughs> you know, so. Yeah, they had some really great funk albums. Joe was on this show a couple of years ago, and uh, I'm glad he's still with us too. Yeah. Um, but um, yeah, it was like. Um, well, the cosmic, um, was it cosmic truth or? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Cosmic truth, smoking. Uh huh. Uh, Undisputed truth, yeah. So, were you ever playing in multiple groups at one show? Uh, a couple of times I had to do that. We I played in another group from my from my hometown area, um, General King. Yeah. <laughs> Mitchell Down. Uh, and I ended up playing, doing that in the truth on some shows. So we, there were some shows where we, I had to play <laughs> two different times. Wow. But somehow, somehow or another it worked out. I don't know how they booked a show like that, but, you know, it worked out. So <laughs> I have, uh, I pulled a couple records out just to hold up. I'm not sure if you were yet with General Kane on this one, but I have this one here. Yeah, Girls. No, well, it's this correct. one's Girls. Yeah, that one. This one is before that. Yeah, before that, exactly. I forgot what that um, that album was. Uh, that one right there. This one is just um, just General Kane, General Kane. Yeah. 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 Um, but he's a Mitch McDowell is a, a definite enigma. You know, I mean, he had some great records and some great tracks, and he even yeah. worked some with uh, some of the P Funk guys. Yeah. Um, what What was he like? What can you tell us about him? Oh, Mitch is a very good friend of mine. Uh, he lived in San Bernardino. I lived in Riverside, which is, you know, 10, 10 miles apart and stuff when we played in different bands together. Uh, Mitch was really, he, you know, he ended up passing on, you know, of course, uh, which was uh, a shock to everyone. But uh, he gave me a chance to play. The, the girls' track that we did was with uh, Maceo Parker, you know. Uh, so it knocked down the walls? Back Down the Walls, Girls, um, I think of too many uh, other acts that he, or other tracks that he did, but uh, that was a kind of a small, or say a small uh, P-Funk type thing that Mitch had going on, you know, he, he, was, he was very much turned on but to P-Funk from that. And are you in the picture on the back? There I am on the far right. He is. That's me. Very cool. I thought uh, this was, I had all his albums. I, I like this one the best, I think. Yeah. Yeah. Although the one with Get Down Attack was pretty good, too. Yeah. Yeah. It was. Fun. <laughs> um, yeah, unfortunately, he passed away in 1992. And, yeah. Um, he he never quite got over as much as you know some of the other successful funk acts for whatever reason. Yeah, he was coming into his own, you know, but uh, kind of uh, you know was he was involved in some kind of some sort of situation where he got murdered. So but a great fun player, Mitch. Yeah, wow, and he was a multi instrumentalist, right? Yes, yes, he was. Mm -hmm. I remember it's a, he even did a cover of Flashlight at one point. Yeah. 
And his shows were, you know, pretty much, you know, P-Funk type shows, you know. A lot of funky players, a lot of people on stage. <laughs> yeah, he's a guy, you know, some people tried to sort of hide their P-Funk uh, influence or, or trying to sound like them, but he flaunted it, really. Yeah, yeah he flaunted it very well, too. <laughs> yeah, he did it proud. He did it right. Yeah. Um, so why did you uh, eventually sort of move away from the normal infield thing? I, that sort of fell apart at some point, right? Yeah, Norman's thing kind of fell apart. And, uh, last part of the 80s, I believe, 89, 80, 87, 88, you know, somewhere in there. Started slowing down a bit for us, you know. So we did a lot of records for Norman. Then uh, I started branching out a little bit with more, like with uh, uh, Jim and Junior Walker. You know, uh, did one record for Junior Walker on Whit Whitfield Records too. That's called uh, Get Down Attack. A sex attack, excuse me. Sex attack. Uh, what was he like? Junior Walker. Yeah. He was a nice man, really nice guy, you know, good player, old school, yeah. <laughs> you know, old school. Yeah. So, well, well, he and, and Whitfield both went back to the Motown. Yeah, they, you know, they, they've, for years, you know, um, for years. Yeah, so. Hmm. As a part of the L.A. crew for Norman, too, you know, uh, um, Junior Walker. Uh, uh, we did that one record for Junior Walker, so, yeah. Did it register with you when you would hear one of those songs on the radio and think, uh, hey, I'm, I'm on that? <laughs> well, Which Way Is Up, definitely. You know, because that was such, such a big record. That was a big record for Stargard, you know. Um, some of our first tours, you know, when it, when the movie was out, was really crazy. So you know, yeah. I love I love those long versions too. I mean, yeah, <laughs> I think that one was I don't know, seven or nine minutes or something. It was long. Yeah, that that one too. Uh, there's another one uh, for uh, Undisputed Truth that we did around that time. It's called Showtime, which was about eight minutes, seven eight minutes. <laughs> Yeah, that's the one thing that I don't hate on disco is that um, it encouraged long versions. Yeah. <laughs> you know? uh, as long as they were funky and something was going on, I like it long. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so you eventually went and worked uh, some with Bootsy, right? You were on, um, at least it shows you were on this one. What's yeah. Bootsy doing? Yeah. Mm -hmm. And uh, let me show that on this camera. And that was um, kind of a comeback for Bootsy at that point. He didn't do a whole lot in the 80s, uh, from like yeah. 82 to 89. He got with uh, Bill Laswell a little bit and yeah. uh, was doing that. So what's yeah, Bootsy I, uh, doing? <laughs> that was it, actually. When I, the way I met Bootsy was through George Clinton. Uh, I went to a uh, hotel where George was staying at and with Joe Pep, Joe Harris with him. And uh, George said, I got somebody I, I think you need to meet, man. And uh, ended up being with Bootsy. <laughs> so uh, I, I got together with Bootsy. Um, and it was just me and Bootsy. Because his band had disbanded years before that. And he had kind of taken a little vacation on, on things. And uh, uh, the um, first things that we that did was, what's, what's Bootsy doing? What's an album, that album that you just showed? Yeah, uh, I co-wrote a couple of tunes on that love song and leaking. Yeah, leaking is one of the. That's a track right yeah. there. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. That's that's a fear. That's prim What's that? Prim primarily, um, Boosie and I on that on those songs. You know, Bill Laswell was starting to do things with with uh, Bootsy as well, which uh, ended up. Uh, after touring, touring with Bootsy 
for a few years, uh, Bootsy, Maceo, Gary Scheider, uh, Mudbone, Fred Wesley. He has a, uh, Bootsy's rubber band, and the new Bootsy's rubber band at that time. <laughs> of course, it's changed a lot now. He's had something new to have. It, but, uh, that was it. So you were touring with them in the early 90s? Early 90s. Early 90s. I was, uh, actually, I would uh, come to Bootsy's house in uh, um, Cincinnati and stay with Bootsy for a month or two. And, you know, we were doing different tracks there uh, uh, at the studio there in his town. We had also um, started doing some things for uh, different people. Bootsy originally... Uh, Turn into I've got this. He's in this group, and they need us to play guitar on some stuff and that and, and keyboards and some stuff. And ended up being delight, you know, with um, that bass line. The bass line on um, the group is in the heart. It's basically an old uh, um, line from Herbie Hancock album, you know. So it was that. That was a turn on for that. Well, wow. what what was Bootsy like to work with? Was he just a, a a lot of fun or a lot of fun? You know, a lot of fun. I've heard so many different things about Bootsy, but when I met him, it was a lot of fun. You know, um, working with him on a personal level like that. You know, just the two of us doing, coming up with, with doing this album and stuff. You know, was quite the trip for me because I'd always wanted to play in Bootsy's band. You know. So we did that. We did uh, one of our first shows that we did was for um, David Sanborn, the, the night music David Sanborn uh, show. Yeah, stretching out was on there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I'm playing on that. Yeah. Wow, that was a great performance. Yeah, it was fun. That was real fun. And that show was cool too. I hate to see it go. Yeah, the show, the Sanborn show, was really cool. You know, interacting with different players. You know, David would do some really out things. I think that the, the show that we did with um, uh, Alan Toussaint was on that same bill for um, the David Sanborn show. So being up close like that, I mean, Bootsy as a, as a player, um, was he everything you thought he would be or what? anything surprised you about his approach? No, he was everything I, I thought it would be. Everything, yeah. Uh, kind of, you know, I had that old, old school thing, you know, uh, the Norman kind of thing with, the, you know, the way he, he knew, knew what he wanted out of the tracks, you know. So. <clears throat> and he, uh, Leakin got redone on that other record he did, the hardware record with uh, Buddy Miles and Steve Salas. So yeah. he liked it enough where he even did it again. Yeah. Yeah, which is cool. Uh, Stevie Salas, you're talking about. Stevie Salas, yeah. yeah. Yep. Um, so did you go overseas with Bootsy's New Rubber Band? Oh, yeah. Because Japan, you guys went to Japan, right? We did Japan a few times. We did Europe a few times, you know. Uh, I remember some of the shows we did earlier uh, in the... Uh, Around the time of doing David Sanborn, we did some shows. It just was Bootsy's rubber band at, I uh, can't remember the club, but it was right not too far from the Trade Center. And so I really, really remember the Trade Center from that. I remember seeing some of those um, uh, like videos of the Japan shows, and they were really cool. Yeah. And I was wishing that he was still touring as much uh, domestically, but it was kind of just a time where the funk you know, went abroad a little bit. Yeah. You know? Yeah. Yeah. What was it like playing all those uh, classic Bootsy songs? Oh, man. Big fun. Big fun. We would rehearse at a Bootsy's house there in Cincinnati. And uh, um, so I've got two cats, two dogs. One of my dogs' names is Maceo. So, <laughs> all right. All right. So I was asking, what was it like playing those classic Bootsy tracks? A lot of fun, man. You know, one of the first tracks we did was Stretching Out, you know. Um, a lot of fun playing those tracks. You know, uh, Boosie's uh, brother Phelps, 
uh, we became kind of close, you know, and learning those songs from him and from Bootsy it was really, really nice, nice thing. So we um, we toured quite a bit with the the, the Bootsy, doing Bootsy stuff between band, between Stargard and other things. I, I would always uh, want to do touring touring with Bootsy um, overseas. It was really nice. Yeah. Was that your first time going overseas like that? No, no, I had been overseas quite a bit with the uh, Rolls Royce, London Street Truth, Japan, England. You know, <clears throat> one of the first shows that I know remember doing uh, when we were doing Boots and stuff. We, he told me we're going to be doing these dates with this group called uh, Delight, and our first first gig is going to be um, Rock and Rio. I was trying to think, Rock and Rio, like Rio, Texas, written on, no, Rio, so, <laughs> Rio, so, you know, Brazil. And uh, our first our first date that we did with uh, Delight, we opened up for Prince for Rock and Rio for MTV, which is, uh, that show was like maybe... 82,000 people there in uh, a soccer stadium there in, in Rio. That was a lot of fun. Wow. I remember that Prince show was, I think, the nude tour. Yeah. I remember seeing him do that. Yeah. Wow. <laughs> I always hear from uh, musicians how it's such an amazing experience playing to some of those other countries, especially you know, where the language is different, but they seem to know the lyrics and things like that. Yeah, which is kind of crazy. You know. Yeah, our Japanese shows were a lot like that. You know, uh, couldn't believe we're, we're you know, they've, I guess they've been listening to their homework, you know, so. Got to learn from Phelps. I mean, he is definitely one of the, to me, unsung great rhythm guitar players. Yeah, coming from James Brown's band, yeah. Yeah, he, uh, very, very good inspiration from him. And uh, was Bernie Worrell part of that, too? Yeah, Bernie was a part of that. Uh, the group, actually, that was playing behind uh, Delight was, uh, see, Bernie Worrell, Maceo, Fred Wesley, uh, Kit Funkadelic, uh, Michael Hampton, myself, uh, Roger, I can't remember Roger's last name, the drummer. And uh, that was pretty much much the band, the touring band. Wow. Mike Campton, um, love his playing, too. Oh, yeah. Mike's a good guy. Yeah. yeah. And so um, why did that f come to a close at whenever it did? Well, we did the first big two tours, you know, while that while that record was uh, being rotated on MTV every 15 minutes or something, you know. So, and uh, we toured with did the tours with uh, Delight, and then after that we did uh, some shows with Boosie, and we just kind of went ways for a minute, you know. Were you also uh, part of any of the uh, songs that became Blasters of the Universe? Yeah. I can't remember the tracks, but uh, yeah. Any other uh, guitar players that come to mind that were really among your favorites? Uh, well, let's see. Michael, I really enjoyed Michael's playing. Uh, Glenn Goins, uh, um, Gary Scheider, I really enjoyed their playing. I think one of the main players that I really, really tried to, um, I guess, emulate or whatever, was Sly Stone's brother, Freddie Stone. Hmm. You know, he's really, really a good player. I kind of picked up on that kind of early on, you know. So I, some of that playing, I think, probably still comes out of my playing, you know. Yeah. Um. And you also did some playing with George Clinton himself, right? Oh, yeah. Yeah, what was the extent of that? 
Uh, George Stan, we did um, a few albums for George. Um, and I think back. Um, oh man, this is I can't remember all of them. But uh, we did some shows. Uh, yeah. During his Capitol years, right? When he was with yeah. Capitol. Yeah. 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 Um, but he had. Um, I mean, I don't know if you, were you on any of the the records or just the tours. No, I, I was on some of the records. So, like, you shouldn't have bit fish or um, R and B skeletons in the closet or. Yeah. Um, man, there's quite a few of them in there that I, I know I played on. I just so many, <laughs> so many of them. He did also the Jimmy G and the Tack Kids stuff and Incorporate Thing Band and um, what was the other clinic? I mean, the first one was Computer Games in 82, but then um, he did uh, three others with Capital. I named two of them. We did it quite a lot. And yeah. Well, I saw I, I saw a credit listed for you on the Our Gang Funky compilation. Yeah, Our Gang Funky, yeah. Yeah. But I and know there's, there's so often a lot of credits that, you know... Or not out there, so. Oh yeah, there was uh, I'm trying to think of the other one we did for George's son Traylon. Yeah, Tracy. Uh, can't remember the exact songs, but we did that for his album Traylon. Yeah, the Drop the Line, the album. Yeah, Drop the Line. Yeah. So, what was it like to work with George? Oh man, George was just man. That was, uh, I like watching him like I watched Norman Whitfield. You know, George in the studio was incredible. You know, some of the things he could come up with. Um, he knew what he wanted, you know. Uh, which uh, one of my good friends who passed away uh, on disappears with Gary Scheider. You know, that's I uh, really, really enjoyed uh, working through Gary. I played, you know, so. Yeah, well, if someone asked you, you know, I mean, what do you think the genius of George Clinton is? What would you say? Hmm. Lyric, lyrically, this is a genius. Uh, Concept-wise, he knows exactly what he wanted, you know. Although it seemed to be a big jam, you know. George knows how to put the vibe on, you know. So. And then you uh, got on that record award that we saw back here, the Keith Washington. Uh, how did that come about? When, when I was working uh, in Detroit, uh, I was working for a, a gentleman at a studio there named uh, uh, Don Davis. Mm -hmm. And we worked out of, I uh, um, can't remember, the studio it was really popular. United Sound? United Sound, exactly. Uh, did a lot of work out of there, and we, one of the, there was a guy that used to be like a, I guess he was he was doing a lot of demos for Don Davis, uh, and Don turned me on to him and wanted to see what I could do with it, and uh, that was basically Keith Washington. So we came up with the "Kissing You" track and a couple other tracks off that album, which uh, he he's doing a lot of demos for me at that time too, Keith Washington. And Keith saying um, kind of took off with the Kissing You project, yeah. And did you do any live performances with him or just studio? With Keith? No. I did, did no live performances with Keith. None. And we kind of uh, we kind of parted ways after that record came out. It just kind of went sideways, you know. Yeah. Well, at least it was successful, though. Yeah, it was. Yeah. It was. My first big production credit, <laughs> you know. And then uh, what what did you get busy with uh, for the rest of the, you know, 90s? And what, what came after uh, Bootsy and, and all that? Well, what came after Bootsy was, you know, when I stopped playing with Bootsy and stopped really, you know, not touring as much and playing with George and doing this other thing, this R&B thing with Keith. Uh, Things start, you know, slowing down a bit, you know, still did some more touring, you know. Um, I eventually, um, 
like I said, I uh, I moved to Tahoe, which I started doing musical theater in Tahoe, Lake Tahoe, you know, for different shows that come to the casinos and stuff like that. Um, which, you know, I enjoy, I enjoy living in Tahoe. I stayed in Tahoe, you know, pretty much, you know. Yeah, I did a few things for uh, the Unspeeded Truth. We went overseas a couple of times with that. And another group that Joe Pep had called the Fabulous Peps. Mm. Yeah, and uh, that eventually got me my my uh, uh, induction into the R&B Hall of Fame. Playing for the Fabulous Peps and for the Unspeeded Truth. And congratulations on that. Yeah. How how'd you feel about that, and and did you go somewhere to accept it, or how'd that? Go yeah, back? we did. We went to to Detroit to accept it, and um, we got uh, let's see, it was Undisputed Truth and uh, the Peps. We received that in Detroit. I can't remember the name of the auditorium, but uh, that was that was so much fun. Seeing all the folks I hadn't seen in a long time, you know. What year was that? That was uh, 2010, I believe. Um, and, and then you've been fronting your own band, right? In the yeah, I, I put together my own band here in, here in Tahoe. We've been working a good 20 years now. Got a lot of play out of that here in Tahoe. And I meet a lot of people. And I finally met a, a gentleman uh, doing some things. His name was Roger Smith, uh, which in, in turn, he turned me on to an audition for uh, Tower Power. That's how I got in the tower, saying like that, which is a total knockout for me. That was the other group that I wanted to be, be in, you know, do my Tower, Sly, Bootsy, yeah. When have you played with Tower Power? I played with Tower Power 2006. I played with Tower, did uh, maybe almost, I don't know, 50 some odd dates in a touring van, you know. And then they got a hint that they might be going back into the, or they were going to be inducted into the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. So their guitar player, the original guitar player, wanted to come back and play, so I had to step aside. <laughs> wow. What was it like? I mean, having that uh, horn section on stage with you, what was that like? Oh my God. <laughs> that was incredible. That was incredible. Like I said, I, I, I liked Tower for, for a long time, so this is kind of a dream come true for me. Yeah. I had Emilio on not that long ago. He was great. Uh, really had a good time with him. Yeah. Good guy, man. Really nice guy. I'm so glad that I got to do that sh those shows with them. They've changed my life. And they're still going, you know? Still going. Still going. God <laughs> bless know? them, yeah. And sound just as good as ever, you know. They do. They sound really good. Uh, so when you front your own group, what kind of material are you doing mostly? I do a lot, you know, I do a lot of Hendrix stuff. I do a lot of funk stuff. I do a lot, you know, do some P-Funk stuff, you know. A lot of blues, you know. Uh, I call it whatever the party called for. You know, was pretty much, <laughs> you know, what I did. And, uh, you know, we just, uh, very popular here in Northern California, you know, here in Tahoe and around the surrounding areas, you know, so. Yeah, well, that's the old George Clinton adage, whatever the party calls for. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> uh, what What would you say, uh, what's, what's a, a key to playing funk rhythm guitar you know if somebody was looking to try to master it or, or learn it what would you advise space basically what you don't hear is the funk you know i mean what you uh, don't play is the funk you know um being able to be able to find your own lock in the groove you know uh, space timing you know everything's on the one you know, my playing, um, uh, playing in my group, you know, I, I get to do a lot of Hendrix stuff, so that was, that's been a lot of fun, 
too, as well. How many pieces in the van? In my van? Seven. Oh. So you got horns too? Yeah. So we just lost our keyboard player, um, an organ player who just passed away. His name is Terry Ogg. That's, my band's been pretty fun playing and doing those shows here in the North California, so I enjoy that. Have you ever considered, you know, uh, recording again or anything like that? I, I do, you know, I've got my little setup here, <laughs> my little studio here. Uh, I do, but you know, nowadays, man, you know, health, my health thing has uh, been kind of crazy for the last couple of years. I had a stroke. I uh, thought I had kidney problems. I'm on a dialysis machine, <laughs> you know, so. Still try to play a lot, though. Yeah. I had seen, um, you know, that you had had some struggles uh, health-wise, and, and so I'm so glad to see you here today like this. I mean, it's fantastic, and I hope that um, it's a sign that, you know, you're doing as as well as you could be. Yeah, I am. I am. I'm so, so thankful to uh, my lady, number one lady, Miss Lisa, you know, for keeping me alive, that's for sure. But we're all in, indebted to her for that. Um, when you look back, you mentioned uh, Tower of Power being such a thrill and um, some of the other things. But is there a, a singular accomplishment that you feel most proud about? With Tower or with your Just band? with the, all of it. Yeah, you know, I, the, my biggest thrill comes from, you know, a lot of the Norman Whitfield days, you know. Although, you know, all the things I learned from Norman and through Norman and uh, finally getting to, to play with Tower, you know, these things were so important to me in my career. And I don't think there's going to be too much more, too much more after this. I've, I've been doing some things, you know, uh, locally. But now the COVID thing and the action and everything, it just kind of quiet everybody down for a minute, you know. Yeah, yeah. So have you been, uh, you've been just hunkered down most of this year, right? Like everybody else, I'm guessing. Yeah, I mean, I was playing, uh, doing some solo things. I do a solo act two type of thing. But uh, um, not too much playing, man. You know, everything's going to... Uh, what we're going to do next after this COVID thing, you know, if there's an after, <laughs> afterlife, so. Yeah, well, hopefully they'll have a vaccine soon and we'll get back to live music. There we go. So I love live music. <laughs> um, what What is it about funk music in particular that is just so special to you? Oh, man. I just, the, uh, the teamwork, you know, the teamwork. Because you have a lot of people playing on these tracks. It's about finding your own space and being able to keep that space without overplaying, you know. Uh, a lot of folks think you can just jump on funk and just play along, but it's, it's not that. It's really a concept, you know. And each band, each one of these bands are going to have their own particular concept. You know, Tower has, has theirs, Sly has his, uh, George Lynn has his, Bootsy has his own, you know. But I've been fortunate enough to be able to play on all these different things from rhythm and blues, funk, funk rock, whatever you want to call it, you know. So are you more comfortable playing rhythm or lead, do you think? Rhythm, rhythm. You know, I, I like playing lead a lot, you know, but, you know, being in a group that maybe it might have three guitar players, you know, you, could, you don't want to step on each other's toes, you know. So, like, you know, playing with P-Funk or playing with with Tower where it's really strict and plain, you know, parts, you know. It pleases me a lot. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, um, is there anything else that you hope to accomplish before it's all said and done? Yeah. <laughs> I hope I could write a song someday <laughs> to describe the feelings that we're going through right now. You know, uh, 
I've done so much, man, that I, I, I'm so appreciative of it. Yeah, and as I get older, you know, um, thankful, very thankful. Well, I'm thankful that you've shared it with everybody today on this show and uh, with me, and it's been great getting to know you better. Trey, I really appreciate it. Thank you so much, man. I appreciate this. Thank, thank you. Hey, back at Truth and Rhythm headquarters. Thank you for joining us on another magical ride with Truth and Rhythm. Whether you're watching or listening, as always, thank you so much for your continued interest and support. Be sure to subscribe. Go to YouTube. Go to the Funk and Stuff channel. That's where Truth and Rhythm lives and breathes and thrives. Also, goodies here like TIR Quick Takes. And if you subscribe, you know what? You get the show before anyone else. It's free. If you love jazz, funk, R&B, soul, you can't miss it. Pass it along. Tell a friend. Tell family. This audience is growing, and it is a beautiful thing, all coming together for the love of this great music. Also, if you can throw us a buck or two, we could use the support financially, keeping the lights on, keeping the servers going, all these expenses. If you can help support the program, whatever you can give, much appreciated. Go to the FunkinStuff.net website. And on the right-hand side of every page, you just click and you can donate through PayPal, credit card, whatever. Very easy to do and so much appreciated. And if you do a sizable donation, I will mention you on the program. Also, drop me a line. Email me at scottg at funkinstuff.net. Let me know who else you'd like to see on the show, what you enjoy about the music. Let's just kibitz and uh, talk about stuff, you know, talk music. You'll find that I respond very quickly, and I much enjoy the uh, rapport and the camaraderie and the interaction. Always remember, this is your show, The True Music Lover. So for now, that's all the time we have for this one. It's a wrap. As always, Scott Dr. GX Goldfine saying, keep on vibrating to the rhythm of the one.